I'm reading today from my bilingual novella, Sihastru, book two. After Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, the apple slipped, leaped from their hands and observed and rolled a bit until it stopped a short distance from the accursed spot. The apple would have rolled on to infinity, except that suddenly it became aware of its situation in the abrupt collision with a newly born butterfly emerging from its cocoon. The butterfly, naturally, was stunned, being tender with birth. But after a few ages, he came around, though unaware of the time lost and the uncanny event besides. When he came to his senses, the apple had long vanished. The butterfly blinked as if to freeze moments of evolution that had skipped over the unconscious slumber and compensated the comatose butterfly in the following mystical way. Such an example of punctuated events would much later be called déjà vu. Thus he reemerged from a cosmic coma with the sense that he had lived this event before. True, he was unsettled because the cocoon and the apple were nowhere in sight. But by and by his confusion dispersed nevertheless and misted the moon with strange dew. Soon he managed to climb freely in the air with nervous ease, as if only yesterday he was born in a tiny silk cave. Later on, he found his mate, significantly advanced by now, and in her turn she was charmed by the fragrance of the apple that rose from the beating wings of the bewitched butterfly. At the appointed time, according to heavenly custom, another infant butterfly emerged from his similarly distinctive cocoon, of the rare Parnassian type, only this one was fitted with little wings of apple leaves rather than the diaphanous variety of his kind. The curious little creature was delighted, if surprised, when on his first flight he had heard a harmonious melody produced by his beating wings. In a little while even the great god took interest and called the little butterfly before him for a word. Say, kid, where did you learn to play like that? "'What do you mean, my lord?' he answered, playing his wings softly and clinging to a branch that bobbed lightly so that he would not lift off in unexpected flight. "'These wings of yours, where did you get them?' God asked more precisely. "'From my cocoon, your highness.' And God, stroking his beard white as milk, marveled and whispered to himself, "'Why, I've never heard such a thing.' "'Are you angry, master?' On the contrary, said he, smiling, I kind of like it. Play some more. And the little butterfly reprised the song from long ago in the future. Then God asked, What is the name of this tune, little one? Gugulan kukar kumere, replied the tiny performer. And then God sighed with such divine melancholy that his sated breath sent the butterfly tumbling all the way to the back of the garden. Oh, my goodness, said God, when he found the tiny butterfly hidden in some bushes with his wee little wings tangled this way and that. Forgive me, father's little one. I had forgotten how powerful nostalgia is. And he straightened the so small wrinkled green wings with his holy finger and urged him there to perch. And God saw that it was good. And they say that many times since then he sought out the little artist with a pure and immense longing and would say to him, play that song I like, you you know the one. In sweet obedience, the little butterfly complied while all of heaven paused. And God sang. Book three. In the back of the garden, an old angel slept, stretched out in his entirety on the grass that was as sweet and soft as down. He was dreaming his favorite dream where he flies fearlessly along the edge of the horizon like he used to when he was very, very young. In fact, he was the oldest angel precisely because he had challenged God in this way on more than one occasion. And every reprimand cost him an advancement in years, according to divine physics, that is, which is, of course, light years beyond the crude elegance of earthly physics. Also, the horizon was the very mystery of time, that seductive ribbon that separated the mortal realm from the heavenly. Nevertheless, every time the old man angel dreamed his dream, the Lord spoke to him. Mind your business, 
you know very well you are not allowed to fly there. And for good measure, the great God would let an apple or two fall on the angel's head in divine sport. This was to wake him from his temptation. Then he would chuckle to himself and hide before the angel could figure it out. This one time, however, the angel rubbed his head lazily and drew open his mighty eyelids to discover there, on his nose, the tiny butterfly. He squinted, then focused, and then spiked one eyebrow to an annoyed pitch. Hey, what do you think you're doing, kid? Old man, said the butterfly softly. Won't you take me with you when you fly when you dream your dream? The angel dusted the butterfly from his nose and assessed him more closely as he hovered gently in the air. How do you know what I dream anyway? Well, explained the little butterfly, when I play that doina our father likes, he nods off naturally and then he talks in his sleep sometimes. Aw, who are you kidding, replied the old man angel. Honest, word of honor. The angel coughed so as to hide the smile that stretched his mustache in spite of himself. So? So, he can't figure out why you do this. He, he mumbles that you dream while all the other angels rest quietly, and our father doesn't like it. He says that it happened once before where wonder was confused with curiosity, and woe is them. Well, you know the story. What story is that? asked the angel. The one with Aunt Eva? Now the angel laughed without restraint at how the little butterfly could explain the matter so seriously. Our father said that instead of marveling at the whole garden, she let herself grow curious about one forsaken apple. Woe is her. And, well, there you have it. There you have it, echoed the old man angel. But what do you think you're doing when you ask me to share my dream with you? I mean, you said it, curiosity. Who, me? Why, I'm not curious at all. On the contrary, I marvel at it is all the dreaming part. I mean, besides, I already know how to fly, but dreaming, that's the mystery. The angel was indeed impressed with the tiny little creature, how clever he was. And he agreed that flight is in no way a manifestation of so-called curiosity, or other words after that fashion, like temptation, since it was true that they could both fly. Let me hear you play something, said the angel, and the butterfly shook his every part so briskly in his solemn preparation that the vibration coursing through him ended in a pop in the key of fa at the end of his antennae. The angel looked at him with circumspection and said, What's that supposed to mean? The butterfly paid him no mind, and with daring poise, he played so artfully that in a moment the old man angel joined in, whistling leisurely his eyebrows of silky astrakhan, undulating harmoniously at the will of the song until it ended. May you live long and play as long as you live, said the humbled angel. You have a great talent in those tiny little wings of yours. They say that this is why so many so many Romanian folk songs begin with the words green leaf. Very well, announced the angel, let us go. The little butterfly was so happy that his wings hummed with joy. But you climb on me first and be- behave yourself until we come upon one of those calm metals. Get on my back. Only the little butterfly was more daring than mindful and scurried quickly into the old man angel's mustache, weaving his tiny little smooth legs into the silvery strands. And the angel said, hey, what do you think you're doing, kid? Um, um, Mumbled the butterfly as if his argument might be compelling, even if the angel had understood a word of it. Still, he answered back, don't be silly, you're too little. But the little butterfly tack flitted upward through the bush woolly brows, provoking a mention of discomfort. Hey, that smarts. Sorry, replied the butterfly, who by this time fled facially south and there wedged himself between the silky thatch firmly in those two vertical lines between the lips and the nose that have yet to be named. So the sound bounced back into the angel's nostril and echoed back into his ear the left one. Suit yourself, said the old man angel, and he quipped and wriggled his nose and launched into the celestial straits before he could feel the firmament rumble, and rumble it did. 